Hi, and welcome to AFI Docs 2020 presented by at and My name is Malene Khan and I am a programmer with AFI Festivals. Before we begin, I would just like to thank all of our supporters, particularly our presenting sponsor at and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, our AFI members, as well as you, our audience. Thank you so much for tuning into this year's virtual edition and to the Cinema's Legacy panel. Just to begin with a brief introduction to our Cinema's Legacy program, each year at the festival, AFI celebrates beloved classics and forgotten treasures in our Cinema's Legacy section. And with the support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, this year AFI Docs focuses on the fight for full participation and access to our country's political system. Uh, now I would like to introduce our special guest for today's discussion. First, our moderator, Terry Francis. Terry Francis is an, is an Associate Professor of Cinema and Media Studies and Director of the Black Film Center and Archive at Indiana University. Terry is a scholar of Black film and critical race theory. Her work involves archival research, cultural history, and visual analysis, which she frames within the vicissitudes of performance and representation. I am also pleased to welcome our filmmakers, Cynthia saltzman Mondell, co-director of Sisters of 77, and Connie Field, co-director of Freedom on My Mind. We also have with us today Sandra Schulberg, president and executive director of Indie Collect, which restored William Graves' Nation Time Gary. If you have not yet had the opportunity to see these films, they will be available and free to stream throughout the remainder of the festival. You can find them through our website at docs.afi.com. Now, Terry, I would love to hand it over to you. Thank you. This is a real honor. Um, as my uh, grandma would say, I'm over glad to see all of you and, um, and to be part of this, um, to be part of this event and to um, engage in conversation with all of you. How are you doing? We're fine. Yeah. Very well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I I like to start there because I just feel like that is so much a part of what your films are about in the sense that they're very much about bringing the personal into public space and thinking through logics of care, logics of respect, and politicizing them through the electoral process and really trying to imagine that um, and then effect effect that that imagination um, I thought what we would do is to really talk a, across the films uh, for part of the conversation and then um, and then land you know uh, with each film so that we can talk about the specific ways in which you're each engaging your particular uh, moment and the archives of documents there. Um, and, uh, and then just the project too of bringing the past into, into now, particularly with Sandra's project, right? The uh, Nation Time being uh, Bill Greaves' film, um, but then, uh, uh, but then being the, in a sense, another kind of filmmaker, right? Taking on another kind of project and bringing that into the present. Um, maybe we'll actually start there with Sandra. Do you wanna, can you talk a little bit about like what is Nation Time and what attracted you to it? How did you come to meet this film and then bring it from its past into our present? Nation Time uh, was found by our team in a filthy, wet, dilapidated warehouse in Pittsburgh. And that came out of our much larger effort, which is to rescue, restore, and reactivate important American independent films. I had had a long relationship, professional relationship, uh, and one of collegiality and friendship with, with Bill Greaves and his wife, Louise. And our finding this film after Bill's death, when Louise had given up all hope of its, of its existence was, was just an extraordinary and very emotional experience for, for Louise and for me and for David's son and, and daughters. It's, this film was never released in its full length version. Bill shot, Bill was one of the few crews and the only filmmaker to make a film of the 1972 black 
National Black Political Convention, which was held in Gary, Indiana in 1972. A shorter version of the film was released by Bill, but never this long 90 minute version. And it, so it is, it's not only a, a treasure of African American cinema, but it is an incredibly important document for all time, but especially for this time, because it's about the entire spectrum of black activists and, and artists coming together to try to forge a national unity platform going into the Republican and Democratic conventions that were scheduled for later that year, later in 1972. Yeah. It, it's really an insider's view of what happened there over three days. So I think it's going to be a revelation for audiences. And I'm, I'm so grateful to the AFI for choosing to include it. I, I can't represent the film I, except as an, an, a passionate advocate on behalf of Bill's work and this film in particular. I remember seeing that shorter version in graduate school and I remember the feeling of going on a road trip to Gary after I'd seen it and feeling like I was going to a very important place. You know, it, it really shifted my um, intellectual and political geography to include a place I had never heard of. Yeah. Well, Gary was a relatively small city, but it was it was run by one of the very first black black mayors in the country, Richard Hatcher, and it was Richard's idea to uh, invite everyone to Gary, even though they did not have the hotel space, the convention space to accommodate what became ten thousand delegates and visitors, and they wound up doing it in a high school. It's, it's so jam-packed, uh, no social distancing. Uh, the lighting and audio conditions were incredibly challenging for, for Bill and his son David and the rest of their little crew. And yet it's just, Bill was not gonna be stopped by that. And he really gives you a kind of blow by blow experience of Amiri Baraka trying to call the delegates together, you know, the Reverend Jesse Jackson making this extraordinary speech, which the audience echoes by just calling out over and over again, nation time. It's almost like a call and response experience. You know, yeah. Betty Shabazz introduced him, Malcolm X's widow, Coretta Scott King was there, Dick Gregory, gave an extraordinary performance and very biting performance as was typical of all of his work um, as part of the, you know, there, there were entertainment breaks at times during the convention and Dick Gregory performed, Isaac Hayes performed, Harry Belafonte was there, Richard Roundtree was there. There were just so many, uh, so many important people uh, from yeah both elected officials, but also radicals like Amiri Baraka and people who did not believe in the legislative process at all. That was one of the great tensions. Bobby Seale representing the, the Panthers was, was there. It was an attempt to get everyone from the most radical to the most, into the most, the most, uh, the, most the most reformist, I would say. Reformist. The most, okay. the most, the most people who believed in the concept of, you know, electoral politics and trying to gain power through the ballot box right. to people who really believe that was not the way to get equal justice and, and, uh, and full civil rights. Mm. That culture well, was, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I just, I wanted to alight just on a couple of things that you said that connect, um, even if they connect dissonantly with the other films, and one is that moment of the convention, um, and what it meant to bring all of these people together in their disunity and discord to, um, I mean, to, in a way to call upon what they felt was their, um, human right 
uh, but also their American rights. And I just, I wonder if we could talk about the America that is pictured across these projects, across these films. Um, in Sister 77, maybe we could start there and then bounce around well, a bit. When I listened to, uh, to Sa Sam Sandra, um, I, I see Sisters of Set, I see the convention, and I, Al and I did this film um, way after um, we did it. We did actually started it to, we started a small film for the Women's Museum here that's now defunct. And then we, we, and we worked with someone, a company uh, came, a company um, asked us, we said we wanted to make this film larger and they put the they put the funding into it. It was um, a man by the name of Ed Delaney, who was very very gracious and uh, generous in helping us make this film. But um, what happened was, do uh, we've done a lot of archival films, but I was actually at this conference. So looking at the finding the footage, I remember so many of the things that were at the conference. I wasn't a um, a delegate. I just heard about this conference for a couple, for about two years, and I won it. And I put, uh, got my sister to fly down from Baltimore, and we put our kids in a car, and we and I I volunteered to be a runner, so I actually carried the torch for about a mile, mm -hmm. and um, I in some back place outside of Houston. And we were one of the fortunate people that actually got a room, and we went to the we went to the conference as as um, not as delegates, but just to as viewers, as just to to watch. And we participated in the in the ERA um, events. We participated in a couple of the events because everything was free. And it was very, very open. And it was something that I had never seen before. And, and so when we went to look for this archival footage, it was like, wow. It was looking back at something that I had seen in 1978. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was really, um, really exciting for me. And that when I hear, and when I, um, when I hear Sanders talk about, uh, all the different people. I mean, there was um, Coretta Scott King was there. It was Barbara Jordan. It was Bella Abzig. It was Gloria Steinem. It was Betty Friedan. And it was, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other people I was jotting down. Um, it was Ann Richards. And there was just, and then there was just so, there was Ellie Smeal. It was so many people that were coming together and everybody had a different point of view, but they were all coming together to try to make a difference and to try to make changes in women's rights and to set an agenda. And they, and my sister and I peeked into these meetings that we weren't invited to. And I remember people yelling and screaming at each other and um, trying to hash out, you know, uh, some agreements on things. They came together to, um, to, have platforms and they had all these different platforms that they find they voted on some couple failed but most of them um they they finally agreed on and they um they presented that and to uh, to jimmy carter and these were the platforms that the the first wave of feminism is really uh it's the foundation for the first wave of feminism and the one thing is that is a little known fact Guess who paid for this conference? The United States government. Can you imagine today them paying for anything for women's rights? Wow. So it was really, really an incredible time. And it was an incredible time of, of um, uh, strife, but it was also an incredible time of hope. And on the other side of town, and I can remember the women in front of this conference, um, in front of the hall, it was um, a big conference hall, screaming and yelling at the, the feminists who were coming in. There was about 20,000 people who were there. But there was another conference, and that was a conference that was headed by Phyllis Shafley and, um, and her group. And they would yell and scream at people. And um, they, um, 
So it was, it was, a, it was a, an exciting time because you knew that you were part of something that was making change. And to yeah. be able to do that film was a gift. It was, and I hope that young women will see it, especially young women will see it, to know how people can work together and how hard it was to work together to make changes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I am behind Mrs. America. You, you've got yeah. the real... <laughs> She was a Miss America, believe me. <laughs> she was a mess America. <laughs> the unscripted uh, reality version, uh, uh, as opposed to the Mrs. America series that was recently on uh, broadcast on television. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'm kind of curious about that moment when you, um, when you're kind of seeing the footage and, um, and seeing this event that you'd been to, and because I'm just wondering about, did you feel any tension between what the news coverage captured and what you remembered? Or did you feel like there was, um, that it was a really a gateway back to that past and a mirror to that, to your own memories? Well, I think it was the news. Okay, so you're, you, as filmmakers, you all will appreciate this. Um, there, this was most of the, most of what I found was not done on film. It was done on video. And I was actually looking when I first started looking for those half inch porta packs. And that's how I started. Um, and so I was looking up, says somebody must've been there with those, but we were able to find, uh, footage from, um, the PBS station in Dallas, KERA, because I remember my husband worked there at the time and I remembered the crew that was actually down there. So I knew that they had to have footage somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my daughter worked at helping with the research and she, she was able to find footage that uh, from Houston and San Antonio stations. And some of it was actually saved because people were throwing it away and a woman would see, oh no, you can't throw that away and grab it. And so mm -hmm. she was able to get some footage that way. Oh, I mean, wow. we were looking, we were looking, you know, everywhere for, for footage and we supplemented it with, you know, with photographs. Yeah. Um, and, so, that, and, and that was, you know, part of the archival, you know, part of this, but um, then finding it, the, as you asked about the TV stations, no, because they sent female report, uh, the female reporters here because the men didn't want to cover that right. so the female reporters were hey this is like you know this is my life and so they were they were more liberal in the way that they they approached this uh, you felt aligned with that oh that's yeah that's fascinating really yeah. beautiful and, um and i and it's and and all of the work in different ways i think really speaks to that rescue action right like what you were just saying about like you know women saving the films like wait you can't throw that away we need that and because there's this way in which i mean i guess from out from, from the from our point in time you know like the archive is about the past right it's this pathway backwards but it's saved with an eye to the future right it's the, so that those women are thinking about the audiences you know now and 20 years from now and 50 years from now, what will they need to see? And, uh, and then being able to recognize like, wait, no, this is important. Um, it's important right. to me, right. it's important to us. Um, Turning to freedom, um, I, wonder, um, I wonder, Connie, if you could talk about like, what do you, if you had to say what you feel like is um, captured in your film, um, something that the future needed, what, what would you say that that was, or how would you think about that? You mean that the future needed? I mean, it's, um, I don't really quite know how to answer that. I mean, yeah. in the film, it's basically shows you the strength of organizing and, um, and organizing against incredible odds. I mean, people were murdered for the work that they did, just trying to get people the right to vote in Mississippi. And, um, and the film is also a good <clears throat> beginning to be able to understand what William Greaves' film is about. Because if you yeah. want to understand how 
how did people become so alienated from the Democratic Party and the process? It's in Freedom of My Mind. Yeah. And it really was the time that, that radicalized an entire generation. Yeah. Um, and sort of, and um, also what was important to show, but I showed this a little bit, is that the civil rights movement really built the rest of the movements in the 60s. Um, and many of the people who went down uh, to Freedom Summer started um, the women's movement, started anti-war things, working with farm workers. I mean, they all went out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was an incredibly important moment yeah. in, in history. Yeah, and, I, and just to kind of underscore what you said about the stakes, one of the speakers in the documentary says um, that she, that she says, you know, you had to negotiate your life with white folks. They would determine whether you lived or whether you died. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, that really captivated me. Um, and gave um, a very clear, jagged, I'd say, sense of the, you know, of what was at stake in this film, uh, in this, I mean, in the film and in the moment, right? Um, but I, I have to say, though, I thought that with, uh, with all of the work, like, I'm watching these uh, films, these decades afterward, and entering into these moments, and while in some ways, my sense is, whew, okay, we're here in 2020. And yet it's also a sense, and I get the sense too from the, from the speakers who are commenting on their own movement, that they're disappointed, that there's a sense of loss or betrayal or something there that was not um, fully fulfilled. Um, well, they're all issues that are still alive today. I mean, all of them. I mean, we still don't really have the right to vote across this, this country. Um, everything that Freedom has to say about the Democratic Party is still a real problem today. Um, and this would be healthy for them to look back on so they don't sort of make the same mistakes they did in 1964 for what we're going into now because the stakes are so high today for all of this. I mean, it's... I think they're all surprisingly relevant. And the same the griefs in which I haven't seen, but it's basically, it's capturing all the different ways that people were politically thinking at a time. And I think it's perfect for today's young people, you know, to be able to, to see that. Mm -hmm. And and, and the, the, the women's movement, you know, it's we still haven't gotten <laughs> the, the Equal Rights Amendment. That's right? what I was gonna say, oh, no ERA. So, yeah, when I heard the three states, I was like, three states? <laughs> We've got the number of states now. We have them. But why is it not happening? Because they're trying to change the rule. Now. That's why. Yeah. We I don't that goalpost. Sandra? I, I, well, I'd like to make an, a point about one of the people who was not at the 1972 Black Political Convention, which was really the, it, in a way at that time with kind of the apex of the black power movement, which had started in the sixties. And I think we're at a moment today when the black power movement is, I mean, through Black Lives Matter, it's, it's blowing up in a way that it needed to for decades, but now it's blowing up in a way, it, it, you know, as it, as it should. And I, I only, that we can sustain, you know, the black community, but also all the white allies who, you know, and other allies who are, who are coming together around these, these yeah. issues of wanton use of force. Uh, but one of the people who was not at the National Black Political Convention in 1972 was Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, it's interesting that we're three women, four women, three women filmmakers and and you Terry who who are a scholar of of films that we're talking about we're also we also have to talk about and can talk about uh, 
this confluence or this these axes that cross, which is, you know, prejudice against African Americans and prejudice against women. And Shirley Chisholm, who was so ahead of her time, you know, the first woman to stand for uh, the presidency and black, uh, was rebuffed by uh, African Americans. Uh, those who didn't believe that a woman could be in that role and rebuffed by people who didn't believe in the electoral system. And on the, of course, on the, on the other side amongst women, as you see um, in the women's movement, there, there, there was also a lot of ambivalence about, about supporting Ch Shirley. I mean, a lot of the leaders of the women movement were right behind her, uh, mm -hmm. but others were, you know, thought of it as a Pollyannish uh, campaign. And uh, I think it's so, she was so extraordinary, mm -hmm. uh, but she was left out of this historic national black political convention, partly because she chose not to attend because she didn't feel she'd be welcome. Mm -hmm. And this, this is part of, there's, when you watch Nation Time, there's so much that's in the film and that's absolutely fascinating fascinating, but there's also so much that's not in the film that's going on in the corridors. And Bill gives you some glimpses of that. In fact, a fabulous section with uh, Queen uh, Moore, uh, one of the few really powerful women who was very active at the convention. Uh, so uh, as filmmakers, and in my case now as someone who's restoring films, we always have to provide additional context. And, and that's, you know, that's part of why conversations like this are important. It's, it's part of why I, I miss the fact that all the theaters are closed for the moment, because you, when you can have, show a film to a live audience and have discussion right there with the audience, yeah. to me, there's nothing more wonderful than that. Yeah. No, agreed. <laughs> but this is the next best thing. <laughs> we like this too. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I'm going to, I mean, I don't know. I just tend to be a little abstract. So just like bring me back down if this is two way out there. Uh, I mean, one is like an emotional nice thing. I, I actually really am enjoying my virtual experiences lately. I feel because I'm able to like, um, just like this conversation is kind of come into it. Um, and very quickly um, and engage with your work um, with an ease that would have been difficult, you know, before. But I'm also really interested in our images and your images now kind of being part of like, like the whole social media world. I'm really, I guess I'm really trying to think about like black film and film and documentary in general. Um, in the social media age, we're in a time right now that is, has been set on fire by social media evidence footage um, captured by the steady, courageous eye and hands of Darnella Frazier. And I just, I wonder, I wonder just as people who, who mine archives and who think through the material life of, you know, of the world that we live in, how are you thinking about um, documentation now um, and where social media fits in? Can you imagine documentaries built around these uh, police brutality images, how to capture them? Are they, because they seem safe, but, well, I'm, I'm sure people are doing that, and also people have developed, basically, it's, it's, um, it's films where you ask people all over the world to contribute and, and shoot themselves and send it in. Um, uh, Tiffany Schlein has worked a lot that way. Um, she, it, and that's completely mining, <laughs> you know, the internet for getting the footage that you're going to do. And, and now people are uh, trying to figure out ways since we can't go places like we used to of trying to get, do people's interviews, you know, online mm -hmm. or 
get the person to know how to set up a camera themselves, send it to them and get what you need if it's that kind of film. So I think that there is a, a lot of integration and there has been for, for a while. Yeah. Um, I would say that yeah, Sandra? 16 millimeter cameras and 16 millimeter film was, those were the iPhones of the, of, of the, of the, of our time before iPhones existed. And the great thing about, and it, it meant that mobile, you know, cameras could be very small and, and someone like Bill could go into the convention and, you know, s sit on the floor with a, a, a relatively small camera and capture all of this. But mm -hmm. it's a big camera compared to today's. So. Well, it is, but the point Unless I think- Unless it's a Rolex, is, you know. Yeah. But you know, that, but that's, I think that's really interesting though, right? Because yeah. from our point of view, we're thinking of, oh, it's just a phone. Um, but, but Bill is, you, he used the phone of his time. He's yeah. using the common, regular, you know, available technology to capture the moment and can move with that the way that people move with their phones now. But, but, but the point but I'm you're, making you're though is that, just, I'm sorry, the, point, the point I'm making or wanted to finish making is that celluloid has a very long life and the danger is mm -hmm. that all this extraordinary footage that's being, that's being captured now and that is either saving lives or making sure that those who, who kill won't be able to do it with impunity because it's captured on a cell phone and that evidence is going to become that 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 those digital images are going to become evidence in a court of law but the problem is that we take these images for granted and we think they're going to be around forever and the fact is that these digital images are far more vulnerable far more ephemeral than the 16 millimeter footage of the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and, and 90s. And I know this so well because we are in the process of trying to restore all of this material. And we're in the process of trying to teach young filmmakers that they've got to learn how to save their digital motion pictures, which is not easy to do because the minute you're, you know, you stop paying your cloud account or you, you drop the hard drive that it's saved on, or that phone goes and you never transferred those images to something more stable, uh, it's gone. And but Sandra, do they know, because um, I haven't been following this, but you would probably know this, um, and that they haven't really found out a way to completely stabilize digital images so they will last, quote unquote, almost forever. No, that we don't have field, a still doesn't exist. We don't I want to say one it. thing though about this, about the picture, because it's not just picture, it's also sound. And sound is very much a part of filmmaking. So if the sound, I mean, people will forgive a bad picture, but they don't usually forgive a bad sound. So they have to understand. So it's two, there's two parts to this, you know, saving process, but it's also something where, um, you know, to get back, to you know what Bill was doing, I don't know how he took sound, but that that was, I mean, we are going through. We have we've been in business for, I guess business. We've been making films um, since uh, together. My husband and I've been making films together for over forty some years, and during this time, uh, we started cleaning out closets worth of things, and you know to see what we what was really valuable and what we could get rid of. And, you know, we go back to Mac, you know, a sound or Mac Stripe, and it's like, you know, what do you do with this? You save it because Mag is far better than any other, uh, generally, audio element we have since Mag. So Mag Track is, is the best you can have. When we're restoring films, we try to work from original film negative and original Mag Track. So don't please, whatever you do, don't throw out, you can throw out your betas and your cassettes, copies of all these, but make sure you hang on to the celluloid and the magnetic sound elements. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, um, Cynthia, you did your film in video. When was it made? It was, it was made, what was it made? 2000, I didn't even look up the date. 
I messed up the date. It was, I'm, the film was uh, the sisters of 1977 what the conference was 1977 my husband wrote you, you messed up 19 you said 1978 but yeah. i think we ma we made it in um does anybody know i don't even know the date that we made i think it was like about um not, uh, probably not in, in the 90s that we made it well, what what did you use? What did you? What is it? Video? Oh, we, well, we filmed on beta. We filmed on we filmed on, on beta, and we um, uh, uh, but uh, what we the the this what we got what we found we found just a little bit of film footage. Most of it was um, you know I think it was one was one inch because it was there was somebody um, doing um, something for television, and mm -hmm. then we found um, some. Of VHSs, which you know were horrible, and then we found some you know little um, little you know little beta. Yeah, as you know, freedom was all on film, all of it. And the other thing about well, you that was the sixties. Yeah, no, the film was made in the nineties. Oh, but okay, but, but I was getting no, it, it was shot in film. We didn't shoot in in video. Oh, okay, okay, in film. Um, and it's the good thing that did is it, it forced you to really think about what you were doing before you did it. You cannot shoot it the same way you can shoot your iPhone or shoot video. It's much too expensive for that. And, and conceptualize what you're doing, you know, um, so it's, it's a completely really different process than yeah. I've experienced shooting on video now. Of course, I shoot, shoot on you know digital, but um, that was com completely different. But yeah. I'd also yeah. like to encourage you and all of the filmmakers who are listening to us to consider making a film out of your final digital film because yes, there's some cost involved, but actually it's relatively small compared to the cost of trying to migrate your digital motion pictures from one format to another over the next decades or the rest of your life or what happens after you're gone. So creating a film version of your movie or your, your documentary, which is what the studios do, is, is the most, is the smartest thing you can do to ensure the longevity of, of your film. Um, mm -hmm. A new, new celluloid uh, negative that's put into cold storage right away can probably last for as long as 300 years. We don't have anything else right now that has that kind of longevity. No. We all, but Sandra, we also need places that are gonna keep people's films. You know, because I think that <clears throat> from my experience, because I've done a couple of things that were historically very significant. So I've had places like the Library of Congress and the Academy keep all the things. I've also made some films that aren't like that and I have no idea where they're going to go. Um, and so it's, um, it's many, 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 many films are going to disappear. Exactly. And we're, we're really indebted to all of our archive partners. We're, you know, linked at the hip to an, all the five major national film archives as well as about 40 others, including where Terry is. And uh, it's these, all of these, the, from the biggest to the smallest, they're all, they're all suffering from a, so a shortage of staff and a shortage of vault space, especially mm -hmm. temporary space where they can actually process the materials and inventory the materials. Mm -hmm. This has been a tremendous problem at the Schomburg Center, which holds uh, the vast majority of, of, Bill Gre of the Bill Greaves um, film sound elements as well as paper archives. And it, it's, you, you're, pointing, you're putting your finger, Connie, on a very, very important issue. And it's something that you know, we're trying to bring, we at Indie Collect are really trying to ring alarm bells about this because you're right, we are gonna lose thousands and thousands of indie films, important indie films. And, and that's why we, we started Indie Collect, was to just scream as loudly as possible about this mm -hmm. and try to get more resources, yeah. more consciousness, yeah. uh, and, and, more, and more resources devoted to this problem. Yeah. That's why the labs were so important, because they did hold all of our footage. 
I mean, that's where you store them. And when they uh, had to go out of business and when they, they, you know, all of a sudden huge boxes show that you can't even pick up, show up at your door. Yeah, right. Well, I think that's where Sandra has been kind of finding and rescuing films, like when labs close. Um, but I just want to interject really quickly that um, Sisters, uh, the date that we have for it is 2005. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I, I try not to age, so I don't, I don't go by years. <laughs> oh, right on. Look. Uh, but I think what's, I think there is something really, because we're talking about, you know, film preservation that I want to underscore is the ways that these, um, the stories of your film and the materials of the, of the work that we're talking about exists in mul on multiple kind of time zones, right? Of the 60s, of the 70s, um, the mid-1990s, imagining freedom summer of the of of the of the mid nineteen nineties and what that was like uh, for for people um, and then now I mean we we will be with people in the audience um, when they see these films I can't imagine that you know any sentient being wouldn't see the resonances with today and feel both um, uh, both um, in awe um and also uh daunted at the um intract uh, is intractable the right yeah intractability of the of these problems that they are so fundamental to american life um that we continue to work on the question of who belongs here are we going to share power or are we not going to share power um, am I going to take it from you? <laughs> are you going to give it to me? Get your knee off my neck? You know, I mean, these things are still there. And do women count? Can we take up space in our own lives and chart our course? And do you, and when are men going to start asking themselves these questions about how do I balance work and family? Um, and it's, it's, it was very moving to me to return to these moments in these films and to see how these really revolutionary questions were formulated, you know, in their moment. Yeah, I, I, we, you know, I, I would love to keep talking. Um, but I feel maybe, Cynthia, if you want to, I feel like you want to say something, maybe we can just have a, a couple last words from each of you. I just hope that, that these words. yeah. I'm sorry, I always interrupt them. Um, I, I just hope, I just hope that it's you know these all these films and it sounds like they will keep motivating young people and i would have said that a couple weeks ago but i am so proud of young people i i felt like i've been going through some of my darkest hours and yet you know through some brutal brutality and through in some horrible things that have happened i mean it got people out on the streets in ways that we have never seen before. And mm -hmm. um, I know that you all probably participated in the Women's March. And there's a line in my film that says, um, that Betty Friedan says, well, yes. people aren't marching anymore. And I thought, oh, yeah. I should take that out. Because when somebody sees that, that's all they're going to think about. And that's all people are doing now is they're not just, they're marching, they're protesting, but they're, 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 they're taking action. And it's just more yeah. than just protesting. It's they're 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 making things happen, and we hopefully that will continue, and that will bring about some really positive changes. Yeah, and you know what I think is happening, um, and I would you know I'd love to hear what you think is different. This confluence of COVID nineteen and uh, and the the. The, the, the revisualization once again of the power of the state over our bodies, it, I think is really dramatizing to people. None of our lives matter. These people are not taking care of us. The state is it's just like controlling and moving and we're just money. And the money we earn is hardly helping us take care of ourselves. And I think there's a, uh, I think a very, uh, undeniable realization about that and a frustration about that that is kind of meeting up with this, you know, with these other um, 
realizations around specifically police brutality, um, specifically power of the state, violence, racism, systemic racism. Um, they're, 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 it, it seems to me that they're just, they're all not just connected, but are mutually reinforcing um, that we're all unfree. Uh, and it comes out most visibly in some ways around racism and, and, and of course, uh, sexism as well. Um, may, what do you, maybe if Sandra and Connie, if you guys could kind of comment on what you think is different and that might be a nice place for us to, to close. Well, I think the, the swiftness of this is because of the digital age that we live in. Okay, things built really, really quickly. And I think what, what's really actually wonderful about the issue is that it takes us right down to the community level, goes from town to you know, big cities, to the head of your state, to our entire government. And it's resonating throughout the entire world, which also has to do with the fact that we're in the digital age. Yeah. And, and so people are rising everywhere. We haven't really seen something like that since 1968, which was actually a phenomenal year where there were movements all over the world. It, it was really quite incredible. Um, and I don't think that's been presented quite that clearly, that that's what that year it really was about. But it's, um, I think it's phenomenal what's going on. Yeah, it gives me actually great hope for actually achieving things. Mm. And it's, it's how we deal with it is gonna, and how successful we are is gonna depend on whether the Democratic Party can change and open its ears and really take these issues on in a serious, real way and do something about it. Else mm. we're, you know, people aren't gonna have that avenue. Yeah, no, I kind of hear a drumbeat there. Um, Well, what I would say is I, I completely echo what, what you've all said. Uh, I think quite apart from cell phones and digital technology that there's always been a fundamental power that people have if they get out into the streets. Mm -hmm. And this is the most, and, and I don't think that would be happening. And I know in my own family with our younger generations, and their friends, you know, they're getting engaged because of what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And, and of course, it's a, it's a, it's a numberless number of martyrs. Um, taking to the streets is what gives oxygen to the people that are in power, whether they're corporate heads or, or, or congressmen and senators people, some of whom want to do good, but they don't feel they can unless they have the wind at their back. And it's the people, it's all of us taking to the streets that, provi that, is, that provides that, that wind oh. and, and, and pr that force really, that, that empowerment, it empowers them to do what we want, to do what's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I feel as though, all of you, the films that, that have been selected by Michael Lumpkin and his team at IFI under this Cinema's Legacy section are so, they're so important because, you know, films do matter and people, and they do help illuminate and they do, and they do galvanize, they, they do help you formulate your own ideas and they inspire, they can inspire. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as one of the participants, I think it was Sister 77 said it was, you have to be able to imagine um, that future. You need to um, enliven your consciousness and of course, and all of your films, I think really uh, do that um, beautifully. Um, it's a real, a real gift, a real ministry, the ways in which, in different ways, the films rescue that time and bring them here. And I think Sandra's case, literally rescuing and bringing us, um, you know, bringing us uh, Bill Greaves' Nation time. Um, thank Bill, you so much for your Bill, work Bill, and the conversation. 
I just want to say Bill, Bill was really not an extraordinary African-American filmmaker, but an extraordinary filmmaker, period, with a huge oh, body of work. And I feel as though his work is only now being, starting to be appreciated on a, on a much, you know, in a much deeper level. And I, I only hope that Nation Time helps to bring attention to Bill's career and everything he stood for and all the films he made because all of them are about trying to make the black experience real for blacks, but also for everybody else in the world. I think that's right. He's trying to, and trying to make America real and accessible, um, trying to make that, that dream encompass uh, everyone who's here, that nobody's a guest um, to this like kind of main um, male or white male. Uh, domain. I'm, yeah, afraid we have, I, I'm afraid we have to. Can I say one thing? <laughs> but please, please, everybody who is watching this, go out and vote because nothing's going to change unless we vote and we get good people in office. Please. That's all I have to say. You're here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're here. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much. What a thrill, the honor, really, to meet you, all three of you, and to be in conversation with you tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for hosting this. My pleasure. Host. I'm just a conduit of electricity, really. <laughs> Among the three of you. <laughs> more than that. You're more than that. <laughs> thank you very much.